now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Cleantech Japan 2023. It's great to have you all here. Um, and this is going to be our fifth event. Uh, so we've been doing it uh, since, I think, four years ago. And we're super excited to showcase some of our corporate partners and uh, what, they be, what they've been doing uh, with climate tech startups to accelerate decarbonization uh, in Japan. My name is Juni. I'm a partner success manager here at Plug and Play Smart Cities. And those of you who don't know me, it's, it's great to meet you. So I just wanted to quickly go over the agenda for today. So after the opening remarks, uh, we'll have a company introduction pitch from Global Famostat. And then uh, we'll have a collaborative presentation uh, from Teladron and Impex. And then after that, there'll be a fireside chat between Moment Energy and Enios. Uh, just a quick housekeeping item. So I know there is a chat box and a Q&A box. If you have any uh, questions, please make sure to drop them in the Q&A box, not the, not the chat box, uh, so the panelists can see all the questions. And uh, at the end of each of these sessions, we'll have a two, and, two three minute Q&A. So make sure to drop them in the Q&A box. All right, uh, before we begin, just wanted to quickly go over uh, Plug and Play, who we are and what we do. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who don't know Plug and Play, so we are venture capital. Uh, we invest in about 200 early stage, mostly B2B uh, startups every year. And we're also a corporate innovation platform. So we work with over 550 uh, major corporations to, to help with their innovation. And we'll also run a startup accelerator program. So we help startups scale their businesses, you know, provide them with resources like mentorship or workshops. So those are the three uh, core businesses we do. And here are some of our uh, portfolio startups, and we have now uh, 30 unicorn uh, startups. And yeah, you can learn more about uh, these startups on our uh, website as well. Uh, we also, uh, we, I just mentioned uh, our co uh, accelerator program, but we have about 20 uh, industry-focused uh, programs. And yeah, uh, we have line of sight over many different industries, not just energy and sustainability. And now we're uh, all over the world. Uh, we've recently launched an office in Phoenix, Arizona, focusing on semiconductor. We also have an office in uh, Hamburg, Germany, uh, focusing on the whole hydrogen value chain from uh, production to consumption. Again, uh, we work with over 550 uh, major corporations all over the world, and we're super excited to showcase some of them today with their success stories. And just wanted to touch on uh, Clean Tech Japan and its history. So uh, again, we've been doing this for uh, the past four years now, and this is our fifth event. The main goal of this event is to uh, bridge the Japan, uh, bridge Japan's energy market and uh, cl climate tech startups from all over the world and kind of bridge uh, them together. Um, and yeah, we've had uh, quite a few successful events in the past, and. Uh, excited to you know show you what it's all about today. I don't want to take too much time here, uh, so I just want to pass it over to our first presenter uh, for today, Nicholas from Global Thermostat. Just wanted to make a quick announcement. Also, uh, our corporate partner Acario, uh, which is the CVC arm of Tokyo Gas, they've recently invested in Global Thermostat, and also they are considering they are exploring ways to collaborate together to further accelerate uh, decarbonization. So uh, we're super excited to have Nicholas here to talk more about how they are helping the world go carbon neutral. So with that, uh, let's welcome Nicholas. 
Thank you uh, so much, Juni. I appreciate it. And um, I want to thank uh, you and uh, Plug and Play for having me and uh, my partners at uh, Cario Ventures for inviting me to this important forum. And I want to thank all of you who are listening in and participating in this uh, uh, Clean Tech uh, Japan event. Uh, we see uh, uh, Japan and Asia as critical uh, markets uh, and partners in the effort to um, both build our business as well as uh, address um, the climate challenge. And so we're, we're just very excited to be uh, able to have this opportunity to, to speak with you all today. So maybe with that, I will just dive right in. I'll share my screen um, and um, uh, give you a quick overview of global thermostat and then we can have some quick questions. Okay, so I'm gonna go rather quickly um, uh, to just give you a, a quick overview and then an, enable us to have a conversation. So some of you, or maybe all of you know this, so I won't spend too much time, but um, we uh, have an urgent need to address climate change uh, immediately. Um, and uh, uh, we need, we've already uh, emitted so much CO2 into the atmosphere over the last decades, over the last century, that we not only need to uh, reduce the amount of CO2 we're continuing to put into the atmosphere, but we also need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere at, at the order of magnitude of billions of tons per year in the next decade or so. As a part of that effort, direct air capture, uh, there's a lot of reasons to believe it will have to play a very significant role uh, across the portfolio of different solutions that we can deploy, natural, biological, geological, oceanic. There's a, there's a set of reasons that direct air capture, because it's directly measurable, because we can control very precisely the amount of CO2 that we can capture uh, and sequester, um, because uh, it's very efficient in terms of the overall uh, amount of land that is required. For these reasons and many more, uh, third party uh, uh, independent observers who've looked at the equation have identified direct air capture as an important tool, not the only one, but a very important tool for addressing climate change and for enabling the transition from a fossil carbon based economy uh, to an air based carbon economy where we are uh, using, uh, sourcing the carbon that we need across our economy. We use carbon in many things from fuels to building materials to polymer, polymers and many more materials uh, from the air instead of fossil sources. So uh, Global Thermostat is one of the uh, most advanced companies working on direct air capture. We started over a decade ago, really focused on uh, from scientific first principles at the molecular level, how can you most efficiently tackle this challenge of capturing CO2 in its dilute form from air? This shows a little bit of our history and some of the highlights of the different pilots that we have demonstrated over, this, over that time uh, in that journey to really uh, identify the lowest cost pathway to capture CO2 from air. Our technology works. We've demonstrated it multiple times, and we've been uh, we opened our, techn our our technology center in Denver, Colorado, in 2020, and we've been operating our single panel pilot there nearly continuously on a semi autonomous basis since mid 2021. And as I'll tell you about, we recently launched our kiloton scale unit in Denver just two weeks ago, which makes it probably the second largest direct air capture unit uh, operating in the world ever. So how does our technology work? Uh, well, we pass large volumes of air over a high surface area uh, substrate, a contactor, coated with a, a absorbent that naturally binds to CO2. We then move that panel into a regeneration box where we use low temperature heat, widely available, low cost, low temperature heat, around 100 degrees C, to drive the CO2 off of that contactor and repeat the process. It's very simple. It's somewhat like a sponge, putting high surface area sponge in a puddle of water, squeezing it, and then doing it again, obviously in a different technical context, um, but, it's, but conceptually very simple. And we've, uh, as I'll tell you about, patented this process extensively. We've focused, as I told you, on how to do this in the most cost-effective manner. So how do you move large volumes of air efficiently so we, 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 our contactors enable us to pass air through our, uh, 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 across the capture medium uh, with very low pressure drop, with very low resistance and therefore low energy. 
um, we are able to capture, even though we're moving air at roughly five meters per second, a, a high percentage of that CO2. And then, as I mentioned, we can regenerate that with low temperature heat very rapidly in the order of 90 seconds. We've also designed it so that we're using the most expensive capital in our process continuously with a rotating bed so that that capital is getting its return and capturing CO2 at a maximum rate. And we've also designed for continuous improvement. So somewhat like a, a printer, we can drop in the latest ink cartridge, or in this case, our contactors into the same capital plant um, as we develop even more efficient contactors. So that's, those are some of the major te uh, 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 technical challenges that we have tackled. And we have built, as I mentioned, a state-of-the-art uh, uh, center in Colorado to continue to be at the leading edge of, of, of developing refinements and improvements to our process. And we believe we have both the team and the facilities that are unique in the world to do that. Uh, as I mentioned, we've, we've uh, patented our process extensively across several dimensions, three of which are, 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 are described here, the contact and absorbance, our overall process, um, and the mechanical embodiments in which we run the system. We see huge markets uh, for this, both on the sequestration side, as well as on the commercialization side with, in terms of utilization. Uh, as I mentioned up front, we, uh, the science tells us we need to remove billions of tons of CO2 from the air in the coming decades, some uh, maybe five to 10 to 15 to 20 billion tons a year, which creates a huge market opportunity. As I also mentioned, there's many ways in which we can substitute air-based carbon for fossil carbon over time in the, these mainstream markets that we, uh, where we use carbon today, also representing huge markets. In the short term, there's many different revenue opportunities across uh, uh, gaseous CO2. There's a multi-billion dollar market there today. The growing market for carbon credits, where, where uh, car uh, corporate leaders are willing to pay top dollar um, uh, for carbon removal today, and then also significant and growing government funding. This just lists some of the government funding, billions of dollars in the United States. I know that the Japanese government is leaning in on this and, that, and has very significant targets on, 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 on um, carbon removal and net zero, as, as do many uh, Japanese corporations. So we're seeing many more, many uh, immediate funding opportunities there as well. So our business model is really focused on uh, how do we be the best in the world at delivering that DAC module that you, that's in the square here, where we are uh, uh, manufacturing with third-party contract manufacturers uh, th the DAC module and providing it to developers, owner-operators around the world in, in a multiplicity of diverse types of projects. And we're really focused on delivering the best technology to all those use cases. So this, this describes a little bit how we work. Uh, uh, we will pro provide the DAC module and the balance of plant plans that any EPC around the world can build uh, to a, a customer slash developer. And then over time, we can also service that plant as needed to, pro to provide uh, re recurring sources of revenue. We currently offer uh, uh, several different platforms. We have a uh, our core a ten ton, uh, sorry, uh, kiloton platform that I, uh, I showed you and, and is the background here of my screen. We launched two weeks ago. We also have a ten ton platform, which is a outgrowth of that continuous plant that we've been operating in our tech center for the last year, almost two years. Uh, and and, and we, we see a number of, op of opportunities to provide that for sort of pilot context for different value chains. And then we're designing with several major uh, engineering firms, the 30 kiloton module, which you can see here, which is essentially just a, uh, a uh, using the same exact capture mechanism and, and, and very similar mechanical mechanism, just in, in a larger embodiment so that we can get to that megaton level. Um, we are, as I mentioned, both uh, the, one of the most advanced uh, uh, direct air capture companies in the world. Uh, we also believe we're advantaged. Uh, and some of our competitors are well known at the, who are, who are also uh, have been at this for some time. Climeworks, which is a similar solid absorbent process where we believe that we have a more efficient use of capital because of our patented movement system and a more rapid cycling uh, of, our, uh, of our process. And then carbon engineering, which has a liquid solvent uh, approach, uh, which requires uh, high temperature calcineur heat. 
Um, so uh, today the company is positioned for growth. We've taken that 10 plus years of core focus on technology development. Uh, and now we've uh, brought in uh, Paul Nahi as our CEO, who uh, took uh, Enphase Energy Public, one of the most highly valued uh, clean tech companies ever. Well, I think the second past Tesla. Um, uh, he's, he understands how to take a technology company from our stage to that global uh, distribution. Um, we've done a series of uh, transactions to really structure the company for the future. Uh, we've uh, commissioned our kiloton plant and uh, we uh, are now establishing the strategic relationships that will fuel our growth, including with our, our partners at Tokyo Gas and several others that are to be announced. We have uh, the right team to carry this forward. Some of the most expert, uh, some of our team have been working on director capture longer than almost any human being on earth uh, on the scientific side. And now, as I mentioned, at the executive level, uh, we have um, uh, tr tremendous assets to uh, build the business. Uh, this is just some images from our uh, launch two weeks ago um, in, in, in Colorado. We had the governor of Colorado. We had uh, the, the former speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. We had the White House and leaders across the industry um, joining us for this uh, milestone moment. Uh, here's, uh, here's some of those listed and, uh, and some of the speakers. And just to, to, to wrap it up, uh, we believe that we've got you know, an advantaged and advanced technology one of the best teams uh, uh, in the business on both the technolo technology and business side. Um, and we're in a, in a leadership position in the market, which is just truly enormous. And we see our, a, a path to very attractive profitability in our model, which is just drawing off the proven model of growing renewables in the marketplace. So with that, thank you for uh, listening. And I'd, I'd love to entertain any questions in the time we have remaining. Thank you so much, Nicholas. I know uh, the U.S. government's also putting more funds in this space, and you guys are, you know, you guys being one of the most uh, recognized startups in the field, it's truly exciting space. I know there are a lot of uh, carbon utilization startups out there as well, but we need to capture the, you know, carbon dioxide first. So, uh, very important. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I see a couple of questions uh, in the Q and A box now. So. Uh, why did you place the plant in Denver? Is it an ideal uh, location uh, for, for direct uh, capture? So uh, Denver is uh, a consequence originally of one of our longtime technical leaders uh, being based there. And as we sought to consolidate our research and development and commercial activities, um, uh, we identified that there was you know, really strong engineering talent in Denver, uh, a, 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 a um, you know, a government that was leaning in on climate change and a very attractive place to live. So we're trying to attract the, the, the most talented people around the world to our uh, help grow our team. So it just seemed like a, a nice place to do business overall. And yes, it's a good place to do direct air capture. But one of the things about direct air capture is that, you know, air is everywhere. And so while there are pros and cons of different types of climates and things like that, basically you can do it uh, anywhere in the world. And we chose Denver for the reasons I mentioned. Okay, yeah, all, all important points. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, does plant size increase in, uh, in proportion to capacity uh, in Japan where the land is narrow? A large size would uh, limit the installation, uh, but does the plant size have an advantage over other companies? So, so this plant uh, is roughly, if you, if you sort of stacked couple of storage standards shipping containers on top of each other that's sort of more or less what how big it is um mm -hmm. and that's about a thousand ton we believe that that same plant will be able to capture maybe two thousand ton or more over time as we um you know as we continue to refine our technology in terms of its capacity um the balance of plant can actually handle four or five of those um so what we do is we cluster those around a core balance of plant we don't need one balance of plant for one unit um but just to put it in context, uh, you know, several studies have identified that uh, direct air capture can capture per square meter of land per year, several 10,000 times as much as trees can. I love trees and biological uh, solutions must be deployed uh, in addition, but um, you know, they're, they're slow growing and, um, and they can decompose and they can burn and all those sorts of things. And so uh, per square meter, Direct air capture is an extremely efficient way to capture CO2 from air. Got it. Yeah, I think uh, that kind of ties into uh, next question. 
in terms of equipment. Uh, so if you were to you know start your uh, operations in Japan, how are you gonna how are you planning to manufacture the equipment or are you going to kind of import them? Yeah, tell us a little bit more about that. So um, this is a global endeavor, and uh, we we want to have a global business that is both you know truly successful, but also is impactful. Um, impactful at the level of actually uh, bending the curve on the climate on the temperature. I mean, that's our name, global thermostat, right? That's our ambition. To do that, we have to work with global partners uh, everywhere around the world, and so uh, we understand that J we see Japan as having a, a sort of a um, uh, a unique and uh, uh, you know strategic view on direct air capture and carbon removal, in in part because of the energy posture of Japan, which I know has posed challenges, uh, you know, for Japan over the years. But that means that now, uh, you know, the, it seems like government and industry there has really seen that this is an important part of the portfolio of solutions that can be deployed to carry uh, to meet your energy needs and to meet your carbon management needs in the future. And so we're very excited about uh, working with partners there. Uh, we're still exploring how most efficiently to do that, but uh, we're open over time to working at all levels, uh, manufacturing, supply, uh, delivery, uh, you know, uh, customer, obviously, uh, uh, finance, um, you know, uh, and sourcing all of that uh, in Japan uh, over time. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's where also large corporations that can potentially kind of help out there and, you know, join this, um, you know, uh, growth. Okay, uh, a lot of more questions coming in. I think we got a, a few more minutes uh, for the first session. So let's uh, take this next question. Uh, what is the CO2 price uh, using uh, by the recent released one kiloton scale system and ah. the future price plan? Yeah, so... Um... We're not going into detail about uh, publicly about uh, costs, but I can say it's several hundred dollars, uh, uh, several hundreds of dollars. Um, this is a you know this is our first commercial uh, scale unit, um, and so uh, we've seen this movie before, all of us in terms of uh, new technologies, and we have a uh, technology roadmap that even not even taking into account the benefits of scaling gets us down into the low hundreds of dollars and uh, in the near future, right? In, in, in a time that's measured uh, uh, in, in, in not many years. Uh, and so uh, when you add the benefits of scaling, because we know that as, 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 uh, as any technology is deployed um, uh, and, and has more scale to it, you see economies of scale uh, in many different dimensions. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're very excited about the pathway that we're on. And as I said, we spent a year really identifying what is that low cost pathway? How do you do this most efficiently from a molecular science and, and systems engineering perspective? And so we're on that journey today. Awesome. Yeah. The price can vary, uh, depending on yeah, how, how you guys scale also. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I love these questions coming up. Let's uh, take the last two questions here. Uh, one of them uh, is: Can it be operated with intermittent energy source uh, electricity supply supply from uh, intermittent solar, uh, wind, and, uh, recovery process heat? Uh, process heat can be sourced by solar heat. So I guess yeah, uh, with intermittent energy source, can you guys still operate? Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. There's nothing inherent about our technology. Some technologies need to be continuous uh, or, or or really messes up the um, the process itself. Um, uh, that, that's not the case for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, you generally speaking want to get maximum return on your capital. So you've got expensive capital that you're deploying in you know this, and you want to get as much throughput as possible. Um, but um, we do understand that there are uh, renewables are intermittent. And so, uh, you know, there's various strategies to uh, address that. You can run it intermittently and, um, and uh, uh, you know, it just, you know, it has an impact on the cost or uh, you can, you can use storage or you can pair with, a, 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 you know, a, a, um, a companion power or uh, source. So there's a variety of different ways to address that. And, uh, you know, our technology at the end of the day, we want to use the most low carbon energy sources as possible to get the best net carbon removal or capture. 
but it's, it's agnostic to the source of, of energy uh, in terms of how it runs and it can be run uh, intermittently. Okay, yeah, I see a lot of, uh, you know, energy storage startups and uh, more renewable startups coming in. So it will be exciting to see more crossover between these renewable startups and the carbon capture startups. So Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's just take the last question here. So, uh, they're asking uh, what size uh, module has been already demonstrated. Uh, I could not catch it uh, in the the DAC industry. What size modules uh, will be the largest market, in your opinion? Got it. So we've demonstrated here the uh, the uh, there's my pen uh, the thousand ton uh, scale. Okay, and uh, and we're operating also smaller scales on a continuous basis. Uh, um, we have, have a design that we're, we have a project with the US DOE for a 100,000 ton, a, a, it's a front end engineering design project that's been funded and nearly complete for 100,000 tons. So that would provide the design for the next scale module. Um, in the world, uh, the largest operating uh, DAC unit is about 4,000 tons. So just a, a small multiple of this um, and uh, uh, as far as the way that we see the market, I think we see market opportunity at uh, various scales. Um, there's uh, a lot of applications. If you think about renewables, you have utility scale, commercial scale, and then uh, residential scale. And I think particularly at the utility scale, which is very, very large megaton type of applications, or the commercial scale, which is the sort of more kiloton, we see immediate and long-term opportunities. And if you think really long-term, even residential level uh, opportunities. But I think the biggest market will be markets will be between commercial and and uh, and utility scale. Interesting. Yeah, and it's pretty flexible too. I think. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that wraps up the first session of the day. Well, thank you so much, Nicholas. I really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah. Maybe you can drop your contact information uh, in the chat box, perhaps. But I again, will do so. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicholas at globalthermostat.com. I will drop it in the chat box. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Right. With that, uh, I'd like to invite the next speakers uh, on the stage. Maybe uh, Nishi-san, you can share your screen here. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, we have Nishi-san from uh, Impex. They are uh, our corporate partner here in Silicon Valley, and uh, Japan uh, Impex is a Japan's is Japan's major uh, upstream exploration and production company. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, Kabe-san uh, from Teradron. So Teradron is the leading provider of geographic data acquisition, industry inspection, and uh, aerial imagery using drones. So with that, uh, I'll have them take it over. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for giving us opportunity to present uh, our company and our you know activities so far. So my name is Masato Shinishi. I'm, I'm sitting in Houston, actually, and working for the Impex, right? And uh, today, is, this part is, you know, as, as Juni-san mentioned, we, we, I, my, I myself and Kabe-san later on talking about our companies and uh, what, what we have done so far. So it's Impex. It's a Jap <coughs> obviously Japanese company, Tokyo-based companies. And uh, what does it mean? Impex is we call innovative pioneer energy transformations. So we try to shift from you know ordinary oil and gas company to go into the renewables and all kinds of energy trans uh, transformation activity. Of us. That's what we are looking for. And our main act main co activity areas at the moment: Japan, Asia, Middle East, and Europe. And the U.S. is coming later on. The U.S. is especially like a current transition from oil and gas business to the decarbonized business at the moment. And uh, as total, as global, we, we have more than 70 projects, I believe, and more than 20, 20 countries to operate. That's our area of uh, size of the business. So, like uh, so now now is more than ninety percent of our revenue is is coming from oil and gas business, but by twenty fifty I I expect uh, I believe like our revenue portion of oil and gas is about half and another half left hand side is come from like a net business like hydrogens, GCUS, 
renewables and uh, carbon credit and uh, some of the carbon recycling, all kinds of businesses. At the moment, as we try to expand and uh, invest this business opportunity on the left hand side, at the same time, and we try to be more optimize the operation for the existing oil and gas business, especially for the processing uh, uh, facilities or shipping or <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. So this part is, you know, the teradrons coming from. So as I'm, you know, for example, like our uh, plant operations, or we have a net gasification plant, or liquefaction plant, gas processing plant, uh, some storage for the oils and uh, some other facility as well. So <clears throat> this facility, we are, operate, we are uh, maintained and operating as it is, but we need we act more optimized, more efficient way to run the business. So <laughs> one of the way is like using drone activity, drone technologies. So for example, like, you know, the left top is our pipeline operations. And we have like a, about 1,000 miles pipeline in Japan. And the majority is just, just buried on the ground. So that case is like, you know, if something happened on the surface or an injury event or, you know, some construction going on, then our pipeline might be damaged. So we have to identify as early as possible and minimize the damage uh, as much as we can. Or, you know, the right hand side is this is LNG facilities, but, you know, like a height, like a more than like a 20, 30 meters height. Nowadays, we, we ask people to go climbing up to inspect, but this is, you know, a <coughs> little bit risky operation as well. That's why we like to replace by drone, visual inspection, radar technology. So we can, we like to make more like a safer operation. So in total, as we, we, ex <coughs> we still like exploring oil and gas, we develop, we produce, we define, and bring it to the customer customer <clears throat> endpoint. So we have an entire supply chain operations and uh, you know the part of part we can replace by drone or some other technology as well. So at the moment is uh, we you know we we did collaboration with the uh, Tetra drone since 2021. And uh, first of all we we using our existing facility in Japan as a test field and we do <clears throat> five or six type of, you know, different type of POCs at the moment. So I think, uh, I believe in this year or next year, so we are <coughs> we are you know, using the drone technology and uh, some product or deliverables as a part of the like, normal routine maintenance process, or operation process or something. This is what we are planning to do. So <coughs> this is, this. that's I can say about the uh, Intex operations. And uh, as I mentioned, I missed, I'm sitting in Houston, and this is my contact information, the email on LinkedIn. If you have any, any question or something, you can reach me out. Of course, you know, Impex itself is we are, you know, planning to grow our business in US as well, or North America as well. So if you have any, you know, opportunity, business opportunity or something, please contact me. So now I'm handing over to the Kabe-san from Teratron. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm Kinji Okabe from Teradrone. And I would like to uh, introduce uh, the collaboration project with Impex. And also, I would like to introduce my company, Teradrone. And first, I would like to introduce the project. And mainly, we have done two projects with Impex. And the first one is the detection of the methane gas. And we had like mounted the laser, actually laser on the a drone to uh, detect the methane at some plants. And also the second project would be the inspection platform, which actually will be able to uh, make the flight plans for each facilities of the um, oil plants and fly the drone itself and also uh, manage the data at this platform. And actually, the challenge of this project was to make a whole new product from the scratch. So we had to communicate it uh, with closely with Impex to find out what actually is the true on-site needs and what kind of future uh, is that critical to meet the needs of for making the prototype. And we have done uh, this project to find out the best um, kind of prototype first to um, find out what would be the best to do the 
methane detection and also the inspection pro platform. And it was uh, quite valuable to be able to do the development based on the on-site needs. And also we were able to do the tests actually of the products on the on-site with by collaborating with the Infex. And at this project with Infex, we did the hardware development, such as the integration of the laser system and also designing the uh, mount itself and the software development on the right side, such as the user interface control or the user interface, you could see on the right side, like the monitor graphing of the methane detection on the screen and also controlling the laser on uh, which point you have to see. And this development with both hardware and software was also challenging, but uh, it was also a good opportunity to make the most of our company's capability. And we have been getting to meet the basic on-site needs. Uh, so we are planning to stabilize these products to expand it to the customers with Impex right now. Um, I would like to move on to the introduction of our company, Teradrone. And our mission is evolving the world from the sky, and we are trying to make the innovation at each industry by drones or EVTOS as a starting point, and we're trying to change the view of the sky. And we are the global enterprise drone solution and UAM provider, and we have been established at 2016, and uh, we have had uh, projects around like um, more than 3,000, around like 10, more than 10 regions. And as our investors, uh, we have the R&D partners such as Impex, and also we have um, some like public private funds such as Join. And recently we have been invested by Saudi Aramco and we are expanding our drone business at these energy sectors. And right now our main strategy is actually to use M&A to expand our business rapidly around the world and find out the best solution around the world and um, do some M&As or partnership around the world and find out um, which country is the most progress area uh, of each industry and catch up the in each technology information and brush up our business and also um, spread it around the world. And we have keep on doing those kind of strategy and by expanding our business globally, we have been evaluated as the top three of the world's best drone service for three years. Um, let me introduce our business domain. And our business domain would be mainly three domains. And the first one is the survey. And the second is inspection. And the third is UTM. The UTM is the traffic management system of the drones or EVTOS, which is like um, making the road of the sky. And our future would be like, we have been providing the one-stop drone solution, such as um, hardware and software. I have, like we have done the project with Impex and also providing the services using the product we have been developed or other drone companies develop uh, products so that we could be to, um, providing the whole one-stop drone, drone solution and update the industry. Um, so we have some hardware and software products such as TerraLiter, Mapper, and I would like to introduce some products which would be mainly uh, related with the energy sectors. The first one would be the actually used mainly around the survey, and this would be the TerraLiter, which is a UAV lighter system which is mounted on drone and also the Telelider Cloud, which is a cloud software, which would be able to process 3D data um, from the data uh, acquired by the Telelider. And the second uh, product, mainly product, would be the UT drone, which is which would be able to do the inspection with UT, UT, which is the ultrasonic inspection. And the left side UT drone would be. Um, <clears throat> the drone which would be able to do the inspection and the UT cloud would be the cloud software which would be able to process the UT data. And by using this um, UT drone, uh, the main inspection target would be the chimney tank pipelines and that, those kind of facilities around the plants, oil plants. So would be if we want 
when we need to um, find out the thickness of the wall of each facilities, like how the uh, chimney is rotted, we have we could use these UT drones. So <clears throat> these kind of facilities would be the main target and would be very um, usable around the energy sectors. And these images would be uh, the UT drone images. So we are going to use the UT drone and approach to those kind of um, facilities like chimneys or pipelines or tanks. And we would be uh, attaching to the uh, each facilities and find out the point, um, uh, the, what the thickness of the wall or the point is, and would um, be able to uh, <coughs> utilize and make the inspection of these kind of facilities um, very efficiently and also safely so that um, people won't have to go to these kind of high places to do the UT drones and the cost will be um, decreased. So I guess the UT drone would be the uh, main product, which would be going to expand around these energy sectors. And we are also um, trying to expand these products with Sao Jaramco too. So uh, if, I hope there, if this kind of information would be helpful and if there's any opportunity to um, do some collaboration or expanding business for each others, I would like to um, have some contact with um, the, if there's any opportunity, I would like to have some contact and the email address here would be my address. So please contact me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Masa-san and Kabe-san. Uh, it was a great presentation. I know uh, there are a lot of hazardous areas in you know, plant and around pipeline, and, and I, I'm pretty sure the configuration of the system takes a lot of communication between business units and the developers. So a uh, shout out to you guys for making this happen. Uh, now let's get to some of the questions that are posted here. Uh, so the first question, is uh, I think there are many hidden points from drone viewpoint. Uh, for example, backside of pipes or narrow space, is it enough to inspect only by drone? I guess, yeah, uh, maybe Kabe-san, you can take a stab at it. Um, I actually agree with this and there are uh, some okay. hidden points. So um, we would have to um, combine with many other solutions. So there are some um, kind of drones like small drones which would um, go into the narrow spaces so there's embarrassed drones to um, see to see the hidden points also but also we when we do the inspection there are some kind of places we couldn't actually approach or see by the drones so um, we actually combine some um, way of inspection other kind of uh inspection like the crawlers or robots or also even like using some poles to um, do the inspection so i i agree with that there are some <clears throat> like restriction only by drones so we have to combine some solutions to solve it perfect thank you so you have to use many different tools but yeah drone is one of uh, the inspection tools there uh, so next question is, what is the competitive edge of your company, the partnership with enterprise companies or having both hardware and software? So um, I guess I should answer this right. Um, so my, our competitive will be that we have the solution, one stop solution. So we have um, the technology of the hardware or software. And also we have been providing the services to customers. So we uh, actually have uh, some knowledge about the on-site needs. So the total knowledge and combining those uh, knowledge and skills to provide the best solution would be the um, edge of our company. And also uh, just as this introduce, um, we have some, um, companies around the world to find out the best solution uh, globally and so we could catch up the um, best solution which is the best in the world so I guess that those kind of information network is our uh, competitive edge too. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Kabe-san. Uh, I know there is another question, but since we're running behind the schedule, uh, maybe uh, Kabe-san, you can just provide the answer by typing it. Uh, okay. Um, now, yeah, let's move on to the next session again. Uh, thank you so much, Kabe-san and Nishi-san for your time and the presentation. We truly enjoyed it. Anybody from the audience, if you guys want to talk to them, feel free to... Uh, uh, oh, we'll be providing recording, so the contact information will be shared uh, shortly. Well, thank you so much, guys. And now uh, let's invite our next speakers here on stage. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so we have Kei-san uh, from Enels. Uh, Enels is our corporate partner from Plug and Play Japan, and uh, they are Japan's leading energy, uh, leading oil company. And we also have uh, Eddie from Moment Energy. Uh, Moment Energy provides a commercial scale clean energy storage by repurposing retired EV batteries. Uh, they're going to have a fireside chat on their collaboration. So, uh, uh, Kaysan and Eddie, please, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Juni-san. And hi, everyone. My name is Kay Morita. I'm a general manager of Enos Americas, and I'm based in Silicon Valley to find a new technologies and new business idea here in North America and also Europe. And today we have Eddie from Moment Energy. And Eddie, would you briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Eddie. I'm one of the four co-founders here at Moment Energy, um, where we are based out of Vancouver, Canada, and we repurpose electric vehicle batteries into stationary energy storage. Right. Thank you very much. So before diving into Fireside Chat, so we will briefly introduce our company, both of our companies. Okay. So yeah. So about my company, Enos. So. Enos is uh, one of the largest uh, energy and materials company in Japan. And uh, our main business right now is at the mid to downstream of oil and gas business. And we have like half, approximately half market share of, of uh, Japan oil industry. And also we operate 12,000 of gas stations nationwide. But as you know, the oil demand in Japan is rapidly decreasing. So that's why we want to expand our business portfolio so one of our target is renewable or maybe electricity business in Japan. And uh, we recently acquired a Japanese uh, renewable energy company and uh, rapidly expanding our renewable portfolio. And also hydrogen and other next-gen fuel is kind of our uh, next target sector. And we are one of the largest hydrogen station operators in Japan. And the same as other energy company, we set the carbon neutral goal, you know, and a very aggressive goal, you know, if I mean, if I say so. So, and we emit tons of CO2 right now because we are oil and gas industry, but we want to reduce 46% of uh, CO2 emission by 2030 in terms of score one, two. And also we want to achieve fully carbon neutral by 2050. And this is really ambition goal. So that's why we need advanced technologies or maybe advanced business idea for decarbonize our business and also the, you know, expand our uh, business portfolio. So that's why, so we are seeking uh, several technologies or several business idea uh, listed here. And uh, oh, something is not right, but uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, uh, so uh, the topic here today is about uh, reusing the uh, battery. And okay, pass it forward. Yeah, so it related to like renewable electricity utilization and also the mobility sectors. And uh, one of the concepts we want to establish in the future is that the battery circular model to realize a circular society. So what we are uh, thinking is that, the, so we want to utilize mobility battery as uh, like energy storage. So after the end of life of the uh, mobility battery, so we want to repurposing, you know, those to like stationary battery. And then after that, we can send it over to like recycling phase. So today we have a uh, Eddie from Moment Energy who, who has uh, like technology of the repurposing the EV battery. So that's why we have invested it into uh, Moment Energy last December. 
And we are really excited to be part of the Moment team. So I just pass it over to Eddie. Uh, please introduce your company. Absolutely. Thank you, Kaysan. Um, yeah, so for, for myself, um, I co-founded this company with three of my best friends. All four of us um, are mechatronics engineers, and we've worked at Tesla, uh, Apple, and as well as I did nuclear energy research for the Canadian government. And over the past three years since we started the company, we've been honored by many awards, which I won't go into. But really what we're most proud about is we grew from a company of four to a company of 36 and continually hiring another 11 this year as well. Uh, next slide, please. So what we do is, of course, repurpose electric vehicle batteries into stationary energy storage. These are essentially um, uh, an application that we would install our systems in. Um, next slide, please. And we're really focused on the commercial industrial segment. Um, the reason why we're not focused on residential is mainly because um, although the customer is willing to pay the most dollar per kilowatt hour for stationary energy storage, we really found that every home is slightly different. So we even see um, people like Tesla Powerwall make it pretty impossible for consumers to buy the, the system. What we're really seeing is a lot of people are moving into utility scale, such as ABB, LG Chem, and when they're creating football fields worth of energy storage, but even then, it's a fight the, to the bottom. So whoever has the cheapest batteries win. But for us, when we address the commercial industrial segment, even before the lithium shortage and material shortage, not many people were really uh, working in this uh, market. So it's a very uh, starved market for energy storage. And additionally, that not only because we're repurposing, we're more affordable than new lithium, but really because we're repurposing EV batteries, where we have much greater power um, input and output that our solution makes the most sense for these commercial industrial segments. And for this, this could be off-grid mining sites or aquaculture sites where we reduce diesel consumption between 40 to up to 75% without any additional renewables or um, the on-grid market, which is EV charging, manufacturing buildings, really addressing peak um, demand charges um, as well as um, uh, demand response. And this is kind of where you can see where, why Enios and Moment Energy uh, teamed up together for the EV charging type segment as well. Um, next slide, please. Compared to other companies, um, especially in Second Life, we actually have deployed systems and they were all commercial. Um, none of these were lab settings compared to other Second Life companies. Um, these are all from day one, three years ago, we deployed where a customer paid us for the systems and we do not get to determine how they're gonna use the system. They will use our systems um, however they want. And that, that, what that actually gave us uh, a lead in is data. We've, we're really the, the leaders in advanced um, data for machine learning for how batteries uh, will be utilized, especially Second Life batteries will be utilized in um, a stationary setting where we're constantly training our machine learning models right now um, to be the best and most advanced battery management system, which is super exciting. So we deployed in sites such as off-grid homes where they cycle our batteries every day. If not, one of the sites actually cycles our batteries five times a day. So even after three years of deployment, that battery actually has given us over eight years worth of data, which is really valuable, all the way to remote communities where we're taking in solar, um, diesel generator energy, um, even in some cases, some on-grid energy as well to charge up our batteries and we disperse the batteries, uh, the, the energy as well. Coming up, we already have secured 19 megawatt hours of projects um, in the coming uh, next 12 to 16 months for deployment, which is really exciting. And these are with the Canadian and US Department of National Defense, um, uh, utilities like Ottawa Hydro, as well as airports such as uh, YVR. So when you come to Vancouver um, next year, you'll see one of our batteries as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a really good um, summary slide on, on our company. Thus far, we've risen about 13 million um, in funding. And we, we really, um, had, the key is not actually about the funding, it's about the partnerships, such as our partnership with Enios and Asai Kase. Um, additionally, um, for us, the reason why both automotive partners and investors are really excited about us is because we're actually commercializing. We're not just a, a group of professors sitting in a lab. Um, and for us, we, that's how we attracted many, many automotive partners, such as we're the only North American company working with Mercedes. We're also working with Nissan um, here in North America and a bunch of other automakers 
where um, for us, we're really just expanding with them, deploying their systems in real commercial settings, not just, again, doing testing in the lab. So uh, yeah, that's a little bit of a summary on Moment Energy, and we'd love some of your questions. All right, so let's start a general question. Yeah, so that uh, I'm gonna ask you about the uh, you know uh, battery reusing sector. You know, so right now, so what is the biggest hurdle or maybe biggest barrier for the utilizing uh, but uh, reuse battery? So is it maybe regulation or processing a battery from OEM or safety? So you know something like that. So yeah, good question. yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the greatest hurdle that we see um, compared to other companies, I guess, is uh, regulation, you're right. Um, mm -hmm. So it's UL certification, especially here in North America. Um, right now, the certification is extremely difficult for any other Second Life company to obtain because typically Second Life companies out there, they're buying batteries from Auto Wreckers or eBay where they don't aren't able to get the data sheets necessary for UL um, to get certified. Now, um, luckily, because we've already developed very strong relationships with the automotive partners, they've actually sent all those data sheets for us um, directly to UL. So we're able to get the UL uh, certification as it stands. But um, UL has also identified that we're the leaders in this um, market um, and especially have commercialized and sold product and know what it takes to create very safe systems. So now Gabe, our CTO, has actually joined the board of the UL standard for Second Life where now we are the ones that are rewriting the UL certification to, to make it more obtainable for everybody. Um, and, and mainly because we believe that it's going to take a village. Um, although we, we're definitely excited to be one of the first companies to be um, working on Second Life, especially here in North America, we believe there's going to be so many EV batteries out there that it's going to take many other companies to come in um, and work together to make sure that these batteries are responsibly disposed of. Um, for example, to put in perspective, um, if... Um, only 12,000 electric vehicles um, that have degraded, let's say, 20%. So the average of Second Life batteries is 80% life left after they've been in the vehicle for 10 to 15 years. Um, only 12,000 electric vehicles equates to one gigawatt hours of uh, end-of-life batteries. And, and by 2030, it's projected to have 6 million electric vehicles on, on that reach end-of-life. So it's going to take a lot of companies, a lot of recyclers, a lot of Second Life companies to help solve this problem. Yeah. I totally agree with you. So maybe uh, there's a question from the audience. So would you tell me about your battery system a little bit more? So when your customers install your uh, repurposed battery, how long can they expect the lifetime? Yeah, good question. Um, so lifetime right now, what, what we're warrantying is at seven years, mainly because we're a team of engineers that are uh, very conservative and we rather uh, under promise over deliver. Um, so our that the seven years came from Nissan actually when they recycling a sixty percent state of health battery, which is pretty low um, on this uh, life remaining, and they actually got over seven years worth of life out of it, um, which is really interesting. Now the batteries that we're getting now they're actually above eighty percent state of health. So without any advanced battery management system, we we do expect way more um, life than just seven years. But again, we're already running our cycle life testing with actually in partnership with Enios and Asai Kase and M Labs and our, all our partners um, um, from that consortium to determine how long we can actually confidently uh, warranty our systems for um, past seven years. So 10 years, 15 years or plus. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, another question is about the collaboration between Enios and the Moment Energy. So I'm gonna add it like, what kind of synergy are you looking for between Enos and the Moment Energy? And how do you see the like, uh, you know, Japanese reusing market? Absolutely, yeah, we're really excited. Um, for us, we see the collaboration. We're excited that Enos is really pushing for um, the, the really aggressive carbon um, um, targets. And really we're seeing that they're putting money where their mouth is in terms of investing in companies that can help them transition and install more EV charging stations across Japan and um, even working in North America as well. So that's why we're really excited to work with uh, Kaysan and, and his team um, where we're deploying right now um, and we're working on projects in Alabama, for example, to, to deploy our Second Life Energy storage systems here in North America first. And then after we can deploy them all across Japan and help with decarbonization there as well. Um, we're, we're also very excited that NEOS has invested in other companies like, like battery swapping, um, which is a really great partnership for us because once the battery swapping startup swaps out an end of life battery from a vehicle, 
they can come to us at moment, we repurpose. And once we're done repurposing, we can recycle and create that full circular economy too. Yeah. And maybe Japanese EV market is kind of slow, you know, compared to North America or Europe, but it's coming indefinitely. So that, yeah. you know, we should be ready for that. Yeah. And exactly. I'm, I'm super excited, you know, uh, collaborating with you guys. Yeah. yeah likewise, likewise. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're seeing that actually the Japanese automotive companies are leading in a lot of the repurposing, right? Like we've seen Nissan do it. We're also seeing now uh, Toyota coming out with their own EVs as well. And, and we're seeing that they're leading the charge in repurposing, mainly in the sense that here in North America, it's going to be very soon that they mandate that all automakers take responsibility. And automakers like Nissan, for example, have already created the ecosystem here in North America to, to help with repurposing. And we're seeing uh, Japanese corporates really taking advantage of this huge amount of battery supply that's going to reach end of life. And that, hey, if there's a dwindling supply of new lithium for stationary storage, it makes a lot of sense to repurpose these batteries for that market. I know disposing, as he mentioned, disposing batteries uh, is, is a big problem also, and also extracting you know, lithium uh, could cause some environmental problems as well. So, you know, why not repurpose it, right? Uh, yeah, uh, and that concludes uh, all the sessions today. I uh, appreciate all of you joining uh, the session and all the panelists as well. Thank you so much for your presentations and fireside chat as well. I uh, hope you know everyone, the audience side, hope all of you guys uh, enjoy the session. Uh, as I said earlier, I will be providing the recording uh, in the upcoming days. So uh, and as well as all the contact information, so you guys should be able to get in touch with uh, speakers today uh, if you guys need to talk to them. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. And um, we'll probably do another one uh, this year. So yeah, uh, excited to see you know what, what's more to happen. Well, again, thank you so much and hope you guys all have a enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.